Welcome to episode seven on Coffee with Braz, brought to you by Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation. Love the game. This week, we'll be talking to one of my favourites, Britt Benici. I want you to meet my most courageous teammate, the player that puts her head over the ball and is able to work her magic through the pack. Britt is super focused come game day. You wouldn't want to get in her way, but wow, she is a laugh after the game. Meet my teammate that never says die. Welcome, Britt, to Coffee with Braz. Pleasure to be here, Brazzy. I've been waiting a long time for my call up. Oh, mate, come on. Like, <laughs> no way. Like, I've been waiting for you to be like, Braz, please have me on. Please have me on. But nothing, Britt. Biggest can't be choosers, Brazzy. Well, if I'm honest, you um, are probably mine and Brooks, I reckon, favourite player with Chopper to watch. So uh, you're definitely coming on here. If you can help me get Chops on here, that'd be even better. <laughs> but let's start with your coffee order. What, what's your order? I'm a skinny latte. And if you asked me why, I have no idea, but I just reckon when you're ordering your latte, if you're just pretty plain and simple, like they just wait for something more. So you've just got to add in like a special little term. So I go for the skinny beforehand. Cause and do you have skinny milk with anything else? Because I feel like there is a theme happening here with our team and everyone's going the skinny milk. Like I think like athletes think that's the best kind of milk to have, but would you have skinny milk in cereal? Yeah, skinny milk for a skinny girl. That's okay, the way I like to put it. <laughs> Athlete life 101. No, that's good. And have you always drunk coffee or is that a new thing? Um, oh, a few years now. I sort of started on the hot choc, went from the hot choc to the chai and um, worked my way up to the coffee. And now I probably have about three a day. So yeah. probably three a day. Sh- yeah, should cut back a little bit. Nah, Don't tell them. Good. But um, <laughs> yeah, I just like it. There's something about sort of the mug as well. Um, no, it just makes you feel feel good inside. Yeah, and I'm going. I'm still sticking with this mug comment because yeah. no one has mentioned that yet. And I'm a true believer that I can tell if it's a good coffee depending on how good the mug is. Yeah, I'm all about that. If actually. you go to a cafe and it's just like uh, this is my my own cup, so I'm going to say it's great. But if another if a coffee came out in this cup at a cafe for me, I'd be like. Oh, it's yeah, gonna be, it gives you like it's gonna be hotel the room service yeah. sort of vibe. But um, if it's like a you know it's like a pottery ceramic like wicked mug, I'm like this coffee is going to be yeah i'm ready for it yeah Yeah, i'm i actually 100 percent agree i'm so glad we're on the same wavelength here i feel like a lot of people wouldn't be but that is one thing for me i judge the coffee on the cup yeah no and to tell you what this is actually not a bad coffee as well so we've started off pretty well here i would like to say i made it myself but (laughs) i didn't i just uber eats it here (laughs) just so bad um brita so one thing that is awesome about you um not saying the other girls aren't awesome, but no one here started playing footy as a kid. You know, everyone's, I guess, really just started it when AFLW started to become cool. There there was this prospect of it, it might be elite one day, so we started seeing girls jump in. You started playing footy during Auskick. What yeah. was that like? Because for me as a kid, I didn't even know Auskick was a thing for starters, but most girls, you know, they play netball. Yeah. Why did you play footy? Um, my whole family has always just been really footy orientated. Dad played footy down at the Craigie Burn Eagles and it was a favourite thing to do every weekend, just go watch him play. Our uh, brother was playing Oz Kick. My mum was always involved at the footy club somehow and it was sort of just part of our family culture um, and I've been really lucky. I just sort of said I wanted to play footy. My parents were like, no worries, chucked me in with my brother and um, started playing footy with the boys and it was never any different. Like there was never a time that footy was meant to be for boys in my life, which were, I've been very lucky about. The boys woke, uh, welcomed me with open arms and uh, just let me straight into their team, slotted in nicely, made some really good friends and um, turned 14 and enough was enough with the boys and transferred straight over to youth girls. And I was pretty lucky. I just had people around me who sort of knew where I could go to play the game I loved and uh, the pathway sort of unfolded from there. And you say youth girls, so like the pathway was kind of already started, which makes me cringe of how young you actually are because I feel like we're similar age but we're clearly not um, and I'm similar to you I didn't start at Auskick but I played um, AFL during primary school and played with the boys all the way through and I was one of the only girls so I loved like that I was that only girl and you'd have the I guess the other team thinking oh she's a girl she can't play and the next second they're like get on the girl <laughs> yeah Did that happen to you? yeah um I was the only girl who sort of stayed with the boys team the whole way through. There were a couple of years where some other girls sort of faded in and out. But um, down at the Wallen Footy Club, it was a rule that um, under 
12s and below, you had to wear a helmet. Yeah. Um, so I'd always get the sort of comment every now and then of the opposition coming up and sort of being like, are you a girl? Like they weren't, <laughs> they weren't quite sure. They weren't, the, yeah, really they, <laughs> they weren't really like the features to um, determine whether you were a girl or not at that stage. So um, other than the hair popping out the back of the helmet, they'd sort of have a bit of a second glance and um, have to ask the question. And I'd always just tell them to make their mind up for themselves and run off and try and find the footy. But the boys that I played with just loved it as well. They lapped it up and sort of played along with it. And um, yeah, it was never sort of footy is a boys game. It was just we love playing footy and Brit plays footy with us and let's yeah. get the job done. I love that you think that they couldn't tell if you're a girl like just because, you know, we didn't have the boobs or anything <laughs> yet. I'm um, glad you said it. I didn't know if the B word out. was allowed out here. <laughs> but it's just because you're, you obviously were an awesome player then. Like they would have just been like, well, everyone's wearing a helmet. This girl can play just as good as the boys, if not better. Like no wonder they were questioning you like a bloke because I watch you play now and I'm like, you legit could survive in the men's game. <laughs> yeah, the way you put your head over the ball still blows my mind. I'd probably have to get big, bigger pipes and put on some weight to be able to oh, run please, along them. Please. But yeah, it, was um, it a was it a hard transition going from the boys to playing with the girls? Yeah, it was different in a number of ways. When I first went over to the girls' competition, I was pretty lucky that I went into a team that. Uh, had quite a few girls who had played the game for a while as well and understood the game. Yeah. Um, and it was sort of a bit easier to transfer over. But I think probably the biggest part was there were always girls coming in every year who had never played the sport before, who had never um, been exposed to sort of the skills of footy or anything like that. So every year was sort of another stepping stone of bringing new girls in to develop new girls, whereas now... Um, you know, in the AFLW pathway, but also in the junior pathways, there's girls who, you know, you can come into footy at the age of 15 and know how to kick a footy because mm. y young girls kicking the footy down at the park, young girls are, you know, getting amongst it at school, young girls are feeling more comfortable to play footy um, at a younger age. Whereas when I was in youth girls, there wasn't a lot of girls doing that. So the first time they'd kick a footy would be at footy training a lot of the time. So it was hard to sort of keep stability throughout um, that competition. Yeah. But that was probably the biggest part that, um, yeah, was a real change. And was that frustrating for you as an athlete? Because I'm trying to imagine myself in that situation. And I would have, like, to be honest, I would have found it frustrating because I find I learn in the environment. So if I'm being one of the best athletes, you would have been the best footballer there if you've grown up with it you're then trying to teach these girls that are your age, but you're still only 15. So you're, you're still only like really trying to get better yourself. Was it hard for you to still develop? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm a very competitive person um, mm. and I always want to push myself and I always want to be better. I can always find flaws in my game that I'm trying to develop. Um, and I've sort of always had those traits from a really young age and it was hard to really let that flourish in that environment. Um, I definitely found when I was at local footy, it was more so trying to teach other girls and bring them along sort of with me. Like I said before, mm. there was sort of a handful of us who had played for a while and we sort of gravitated towards each other a bit. Uh, but I was really lucky that the um, TAC Cup sort of, they went down the women's pathway at that stage and I was able to sort of go in there um, and let that sort of aspect of me flourish and really try to get all the development out of myself I could there and then sort of bring it back to the local girls. Um, it was frustrating at times, but it was also, um, you know, a really good challenge. And now that I sort of look back on it, I'm really glad that I sort of got to be part of that. Uh, at the time, I didn't realise, you know, how special it was yeah, to and that it, be could, part of a journey for another young girl. Yeah, and that, I guess, AFLW is a thing. And, like, you, <laughs> I think it's great that you got to see it from playing with the boys to then being told you can't play with the boys, going into the women's environment where – you probably never thought there would be an AFLW and now there is one. So it's so cool that you've actually been able to experience that whole journey. Yeah, And now absolutely. you're one of the best players, like, in the league. Yeah. Like, so it's... <laughs> Thanks, Rosie. I'm not sure about that, but oh, mate, I'll take the compliment. hands down. <laughs> I'll take hands the compliment. Down. I would not... I avoid you at training, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a massive compliment. Yeah. Thanks, Rosie. No, all good. And you talked about um, you had to wear a head guard. Yeah. Is that... So I just assumed... Um, 
I don't know if many people know this, but you've had a few concussions. I just assumed you wore the head guard because of your concussions. Is that true or have you just worn it ever since you were under 12s? Yeah, so um, before under 12s, we all wore one. Um, And then after that, it was sort of no longer the cool thing to do wear a helmet and yeah. nobody wanted to be the one wearing a helmet when the, it wasn't a rule. Um, so I stopped wearing it, I don't know, for quite a number of years um, yeah. until my first um, time wearing it again was when I came back after a year off footy. Yeah. Um, I came back from sort of a string of concussions and Nan made it pretty clear that she wasn't going to come and watch me play footy anymore if I didn't wear a helmet. Yeah, um, she's a smart so, nan. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it wasn't the coolest thing to do. I remember my first game, I was sort of pretty hesitant to, um, with it. And the girls that I was playing with at St Kilda Sharks, they were all willing to all wear one for my yeah. first game. And, um, yeah. Oh, I, that's gorgeous. Yeah, pol- politely declined. I didn't, you know, want everybody changing up their game and stuff like that. Um, but it was pretty special. They were willing to do that for me. Um, but, you know, once I put it on and I went back out to play footy, the moment was sort of about coming back to the game. I didn't care too much whether I had a lid cover in my head or not. I just wanted to be back out there. Yeah. What do you call it? A lid? I've heard a you lid. Say it a few times. Yeah, I don't know. It's just sort of a thing. It's a yeah. bit of a phase. I'll, I'll think of something else no, next like year. I like it. Got your lid on. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I know you wear it for, like, safety reasons, but I actually love that you wear it because when I'm watching the game – and I'm so used to netball, like we're just so close footy. I'm like, Who, what number is that? Who is that? Where I'm like, yep, there's Brit. Like it's such a good thing. And if my like my dad wants me to wear one just so he can see where I am on the field. But so that's why I wear like, the bright boots. Yeah. But I think, yeah, it's great. Everyone knows where you are all the time. Yeah. When Yui came across this year, um, I sat Nan down and I said, because it's very similar for Nan, she um, – she has this thing that she doesn't watch anybody else. Even if I'm on the bench, like, for some reason, she's watching me. Yeah. Um, no, so that's she's a always, yeah, yeah. And parents. <laughs> always looking for the helmet. Um, yeah. And when Nui came across this year, I sort of said to Nan, like, look, there's another girl that's wearing a helmet this year. Like, you're going to have to Hers find something though. new. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Nan wasn't happy. So I, I called Nui and I was telling her about it. We're having a bit of a laugh. And we made the agreement that she'd wear the colourful one from now on and I'd yeah. wear the black one and there'd be no swapping and um, changing. So unless we decide to stitch up my nan uh, one week i'll be sticking with the black and just put sh- put new in black as well so it looks like you're everywhere yeah exactly like and i might get a couple more votes as well yeah, it's a pretty good idea that's a smart smart thing um but you talk about your concussions having a year off yep. like i've been concussed before and i, I didn't realize actually how big it was i just thought okay it's, it's a head knock and then you have a week off or whatever until i experienced memory loss in my one um you were f- only 16 when you had your first concussion and then you had a year off later on. I'm not sure how old you were in that year off. Um, but how how did that – how did you go from being 16 to now? Like tell me about your experiences. Yeah, it's um, been quite the journey yeah. um, and there's a few sort of, I guess, moments that are really big that sort of stick out along the journey. The first one would be that first concussion. Um I guess first diagnosed concussion we'll go with Um, and yeah I was really young I remember going to the hospital I remember the whole procedure I remember sort of finding out that I was concussed and I didn't really even know what concussion was and that I was going to have to take a week off footy and um, I thought like they were having a laugh I thought Mm. surely I'm not not playing next week like I'm fine I'm I wasn't knocked out Um, I didn't lose consciousness so in my mind I was sort of like whatever um there was sort of a number of times where that happened where I probably got a hit that should have sidelined me but women's footy wasn't at the stage then where we had people who were um knowledgeable in any of those areas you know we were sometimes running out of um shipping containers for change rooms like we didn't have what we have now um and no doctors to actually stop you and yeah absolutely and Concussion wasn't broadly spoke about in the community um, like it is now and the AFL are really making sure they um, stamp their foot on sort of all the protocols and stuff. But back then it wasn't so widely spoken about. Um, So that sort of first concussion happened. There were, you know, a few times after that where I probably should have been taking time off. But, you know, I was a young girl. I just wanted to play footy and I'd stepped up into the seniors competition and I was really young and I was really little. Um... At the age of 16, I definitely sort of hadn't been to the gym before or anything like that. So I was playing against fully developed women um, and, you know, these things happen. Um, 
then there was one morning where I was at my grandparents' house and I was eating breakfast and I started feeling sort of really dizzy um, and I couldn't really comprehend what was going on around me and stuff like that. Um, Nan got me up and tried to walk me to the bed and I sort of just passed out in the hallway. Um, and I, I didn't link the two together at that time. Um, I hadn't played footy that weekend anyway. We'd had a bye. So to me, it was, you know, there was no link between footy mm. and what had happened. I was maybe just feeling a bit off or whatever, but did the right thing, went to the doctor, sort of get everything checked out. And um, that was the first time I was sort of able to link all of the head knocks and the concussions and all of that stuff together. Um, and we decided, well, I didn't really decide. At the time, I still wanted to play footy. I thought everyone was just sort of carrying on a little bit. Um, but the doctors sort of told me that things weren't the way they probably should be and um, that the concussions had started taking a bit of a toll on my body and my brain and um, it was time to take it seriously. So I did. Um, and, you know, being a young girl where I'd just grown up playing footy, it was pretty confronting. Um, my grandparents were there with me the whole sort of way through it and seeing how much it affected them. Um, my fam, like my entire family, to be honest, how much it affected them really made me realise it was time to take it serious. Um, and it wasn't really about when I'd play footy again anymore. It was sort of just about when I'd be able to be a kid again and do all the fun things. Um, that sort of went right through until I was 18. Um, so I turned 18 and I wasn't able to sort of do everything as freely as I like to do. And um, it what, was do you, just, what do you mean by that? Like you weren't free? Yeah, it was a really unique experience, I guess. I was all of us, I'd gone from this girl who was the footballer and, you know, I was known as the footballer everywhere mm. I was. And then I stopped playing footy because of your brain and you're 17 and all your mates are 17 and you tell people you can't play footy because of your brain and all of a sudden it's, are you going to die? Are you allowed yeah. to do this stuff? You know, you'd turn 18 and you want to go out and have a drink and it's, are you allowed to do that? Um, yeah. Everything you did was sort of questioned and in a lot of ways I was looked at as sort of the girl with the brain injury and, you know, it is what it is. Now that I sort of look back on it, I'm really grateful that everyone around me sort of cared so much to mm. ask me everything and question everything. Everyone just wanted the best for me but at that time it was so frustrating I just wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do with no questions asked um I didn't you know I wanted to be playing footy don't get me wrong but I just wanted to be able to do things unquestioned and be free to just be who I wanted to be um but I wasn't and that was it was pretty tough at the time. Um, you know, there You're were a, a lot of yeah. I was you just want to live life, yeah. Like, and I I understand that. Yeah. Like it's, oh yeah. I was wondering like, do you feel? Because when I was concussed, like, um, like I felt groggy for like a few weeks. Was that? Did did you feel that in the year off, or was like okay, no, like the year off, you, you actually you still felt normal. There were phases. There were times where I'd go through sort of different things. I went through a lot of tests, um, had a lot of wires connected up to my head a lot of yeah. times, a lot of things testing sort of the way that my blood was flowing through my body, the way that my heart was working, sort of oxygen levels in different parts of um, my body and my brain and a lot of sort of tests. And, um, you know, at some times I was feeling that grogginess. At other times I was um, feeling really lightheaded. At other times I'd be getting sort of headaches and build up of pressure um, but at other times I felt fine. And I think that was the hardest part was when I was feeling fine, I still had to be mindful. And when I was yeah. feeling fine, I wanted to be able to go out and do everything I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't. And I had to be mindful of that. Um, and, you know, when you're 17, 18, and that's mm -hmm. all you want to be going out to do, and that's what all your mates are doing, it's pretty hard to stop yourself and take a step back and see the bigger picture. But like I said before, I'm probably pretty lucky. I had people who would stop me and question me and make sure I was doing the right things by myself because having people around you that keep you accountable is pretty big in those moments. But concussion is one of those things. It's not you know a broken leg or a broken arm where people can physically see it yeah. and you know and you know exactly what's going to happen yeah. and there's a procedure that you can follow, a process you can follow. Um, it's completely different with concussion and there's no real end point until there is an end point um and you know all the research that's going out now it's pretty questionable where that end point is but 
um, I'm just lucky that I sort of had the best support around me at the time and got myself to a stage where I was ready to play footy again. Yeah, and so you had the year off footy, but like you obviously didn't play, but did you stay in contact with footy? Yeah, yes or and no. just put it to the side, like yeah. I don't even want to know you because yes I wouldn't no. want to even know football if I wasn't able to play. When I first wasn't able to play, that's exactly what I was like. I knew I just needed to stay away from it and it was really hard because a lot of my friends were around the footy environment as well. Um, and sort of my friends who weren't around the footy environment were going out doing things that 18 year olds were doing. So I was in a pretty tricky place. Um, but I ended up getting to a stage where I realized how much footy had given me already in my life. Um, it had, you know, kept me on the right path for so long and it had give, gave, gave me something to do to sort of, um, stay dedicated and, um, let me flourish in a lot of those sort of traits we spoke about before. So, I went into coaching a little bit. Um, I helped coach the midfield at the um, St Kilda Sharks. I did some coaching with the Calder Cannons at the TAC, um, which I really enjoyed it. And, you know, silver lining now, I know that that's something that um, I enjoy and something that I might be able to sort of pursue down the track someday. But it gave me a new light for footy. Yeah. Um, and at that time, it wasn't about playing footy, but um, I always knew that, if I ever got to come back, I'd probably be better off for understanding sort of the coaching side of the game and understanding what happens off the field as well. Um, so I decided to jump back in and do a fair bit of coaching. Yeah. Um, I was a runner for a few teams. I uh, got to be involved with the Western Bulldogs in one of their exhibition games, being their runners, which I was very thankful for. So towards the back end, I really started to get involved in footy again. And I definitely think um, that that's when things sort of started getting better for me physically as well. And I don't think that that's any coincidence. I think that um, when I had something to really start working back towards and footy, playing footy sort of became a maybe instead mm -hmm. of a no, um, that's when I really took off in yeah my recovery. Yeah. And it's cool that like that you actually got to experience that coaching side because like, you, you did say like you got to see it in a coaching way, but I reckon it actually makes you a better athlete because you're seeing the game in a complete different way. I know like I'm a visual learner, so I like actually seeing what they're talking about. So yeah, that's really cool that you actually you got that experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I was still really young as well. There was a lot of room in my footy that um, needed to develop. And mm -hmm. it also gave me a chance to develop my body and work on things differently. Um, probably wasn't until then that I started realising that if I actually wanted to get anywhere in footy, I probably had to become a little bit bigger to be able to hold my own ground. So I started, you know, developing my body in different ways, um, starting to work on my strength and making sure that I understood different ways um, mm -hmm you know, on how to protect myself. That was really important for me, um, learning how to manipulate my body to make sure that um, I was protecting myself, but also able to be that player that I knew I wanted to be still when I came back into the competition. I didn't want to shy away at all. I still wanted to try and, you know, get those contested balls and stuff like that. So I was really able to use that time to learn how to manipulate my body in different ways. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Now on a, it's, I would say lighter side, but it's not really light because <laughs> it's also terrible. Um, but Steph um, Chochi spoke to me and told me that you lost a tooth on the field. So one terrible that you lost a tooth, <laughs> but how did that happen? Yeah, so... I see you running around looking for your tooth. Like. <laughs> I definitely wasn't looking for it. It was a rude shock when yeah. I uh, came up and felt that there was no front teeth. Um, so it was your front tooth? Yeah, yeah. So these two here. Yeah. Um, pretty much I've always wore a mouth guard my yeah. entire, entire career. Um, it was a big rule. My brother, when he was younger, he knocked his two front teeth out playing footy, and my family oh my have goodness. always, yeah, yeah. family have always been pretty stern on making sure that we wear a mouth guard. Um, and one Saturday morning, I woke up and packed my footy bag and realised I didn't know where my mouth guard was. Um, and I had a game that day, so it was just too late. Um, so I thought, one game. What's it really going to hurt? <laughs> so I got through the whole game. It was happy days. Um, probably about five minutes to go in the last quarter and just went through a pack, came up and ran straight into um, one of the girls who was playing in my team. So that was handy. Um, yeah, just ran straight into her face first. Um, and it took me sort of a moment, but I could taste all this stuff in my mouth and realised it was blood and felt around with my tongue and just realised that, 
one of my teeth was on my tongue and the other one of my teeth was nowhere to be found. Um, so I ran off the bench pretty quickly and then, yeah, all the water runners, the physio and all that stuff were out there trying to find my teeth and I took myself to the change rooms quickly. Um, wasn't brave enough to look in the mirror, yeah. that's for sure. And they came running in and they'd found my tooth and <laughs> we shoved, found it. <laughs> they found it, yeah, I'm pretty lucky they did. So we are in the change rooms and they shoved my teeth back in apparently you got to get them in there as quick as you can and I held them in place on the way to the dentist and the rest is history. So this through your teeth? Yeah I was pretty lucky um, they told me that you know they'd keep them in there until they'd die it would probably be about a year and then I'd get falsies put in there but um, falsies when you're 18 probably isn't the nicest thing to hear. <laughs> yeah. I'd just come back to footy at that stage as well um, but yeah, I'm lucky they're sort of still here. They're still kicking, and I want to know more now ones. that I know <laughs> that they're your real teeth. I just assumed you would have had fake teeth because you've lost it. So your teeth have come out. It's obviously not broken. So, like the root obviously comes out as well. Does it hurt when they put it back in? No. <laughs> like oh, <laughs> was, it's uh, actually whole... breaking my heart right now. <laughs> yeah. oh. there was I a don't whole wear lot a mouth guard. I am yeah, always wearing a mouth should. guard now. <laughs> um, there was a whole lot of adrenaline. So at the time, it was sort of just like get my teeth in my head like yeah. I I just had all these visions of like what I was going to be like growing up with no like front teeth and <laughs> um you know there was a whole stereotype I played for Collingwood at this time so this was yeah. just in the VFL thing and I was yeah. thinking about all the stereotypes and yeah. I was thinking like what is going to happen from here but they put them back in and they put braces on and um they sort of just said like we'll see how they go um got a couple of root canals and I was going to the dentist sort of every week to every month to get things checked see mm -hmm. how they're sitting and all of that and um I was I was honestly just completely lucky like they should not be in my head right now but they are and um I'm, I'm glad like looking at them out yeah. I'm like I just cannot believe I'm glad that you thought that they were um real I'll smile to the camera yeah just check them out guys look how beautiful <laughs> um, they are yeah I'm glad you think they're real because uh, oh they're fake because yeah these are the real ones yeah and they're that's back amazing yeah, well, we're back um, baby no one has ever convinced me to wear a mouth guard because I feel like you can't breathe in them, but you just did it right then. Yeah, the well, thought of putting your teeth back in my yeah, head blows my mind. It wasn't a nice mind. feeling, that's for sure. No, um, or even just like, like, like picturing you like trying to, with your tongue, trying to feel your teeth and then not be there. Yeah, like, like you like think about those wordy. little, yeah, you think about those little kids and I was on a soup diet for so long. It was absolutely terrible. I remember that night I got home. It's enough my, to scare you, soup yeah, diet. Yeah, I know. I got home that night and my family were having steak and my little brother was sitting across the table, like just taunting me the entire time. Um, and I was just there sipping on soup out of a straw, like through the side of my mouth. Um, so definitely yeah. wear a mouth guard, kids. Oh, 100%. And <laughs> kids and Brazzy. Braz, wear a mouth guard. <laughs> <laughs> well, my parents will love you now. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> Um, just moving on, I'm so glad that you're teeth. <laughs> um, but you, like, Britt, you're an awesome person. I know um, previously you worked with people with disabilities um, and now you're working with a company called Ladder that work with um, you, the youth um, of our, our world. Um, tell me a bit about Ladder. Yeah, so Ladder is the AFL players um, charity. So that's sort of how I got involved. Um, when I first got drafted, I remember we sort of had an information session about what it meant to be an AFL player and Ladder was a bit, a pretty big part of that. We had um, Elizabeth Tucky, who was the CEO of the time, come out and speak to us about sort of this organisation that helped young people um, pretty much find their way in different aspects of life and um, it's something that I've always been interested in and um, something that I was pretty keen to get involved in. So I started volunteering a fair bit with them. Um, at the time they had sort of youth foyers. I was heading down to their youth foyers um, and just being amongst sort of the young people at that time, um, I was sort of 18. So I probably wasn't much older than um, majority of them there. There was probably a few older than me as well. Um, and then a role came up um, about two years ago for me to sort of take up and start working with them. And Pretty much we work with young people who are disengaged from school, disengaged from the community and we find ways to sort of upskill them and provide them opportunities to develop themselves, um, whether that be in health and wellbeing, community connection, education, training and employment, um, all these different sort of things. We sort of try to help them, I guess, find their way and find who they want to be in sort of the big wide world and try and get them re-engaged into some form of education, um, employment, training, 
get them involved in the local community. I think this year more than ever we've realised mm. how important it is um, to be connected with people and um, not everybody sort of is as lucky as us to be able to, um, you know, find communities like the footy mm. club or the footy Just world. or sport. Yeah, yeah, I mean sport is massive for bringing you that community side of things and not everybody um, is lucky enough to have that. So helping these young people find their way within sort of the community and find their way um, within life is sort of my role now and it's pretty exciting and I love what I do. Yeah, I, I love that. You love what you do. So what, like, what's your actual role? Do you approach schools, approach businesses yeah, so, to help them out or um, are you mentor? They can just pick up the phone and call you. Like what? Yeah, so I'm working pretty closely with the Step Up Latrobe Valley program at the moment. Um, My role's recently changed. I've just gone into mentoring uh, coordinator, but before this I was a development coach and that was really working with the young people um, throughout programs in small groups. Um, And we sort of have an intensive six-week program where we work really closely with the young people about... um, all those sort of life skill things we create I guess workshops or sessions whatever you'd like to call them um, about sort of getting these young people um, I guess in to a position where they feel that they're ready to take on sort of whatever might be next for them those um, community connections those education pathways those jobs Um, a lot of young people come into our program not really sure who they are yet or who they want to be or um, who they can really be I guess a lot of them sort of come in and feel like um, the world might be against them or sort of feel like they're not they're not really going anywhere or stuck which is so common for young people um, I know I definitely was like that when I was a bit younger and we I'm just sort of that person who can help guide them um, to find themselves throughout those six weeks um, give them skills and fundamentals that can help them to discover themselves and for them to really grow on yeah and why why did you get involved like what what drew you there I love people. Um, I'm a real people person. And I think that um, sort of as I was growing up, I sort of was exposed to a few different things that some um, some young people might come across that can really deter them from pathways. Um, When I was younger, my sort of parents split up and that was pretty rough for me at the time. I'm really lucky now with my parents' dynamic that they're really good friends. And, um, you know, it's sort of definitely been a silver lining in the whole situation that we've been able to grow as a family from it. Um, But at that time, that's pretty rough. And I know how rough that can be for young people, especially if their family um, doesn't have the dynamic that mine do now. Um, Sort of the whole concussion side of things, I realise what it's like to have something you love so much taken taken from you so abruptly. Um, When I was going through high school, one of my best mates passed away really suddenly um, in a crazy accident. And it sort of just made me realise that life changes so quickly and so rapidly and... um, you can't really prepare for anything that's going to happen, but all you can do is get yourself in a position where you're capable of handling different things and you're capable of moving forward. And um, I know for me, when I was going through a lot of those things, uh, what probably helped me was seeing people around me who had been through similar things and who were able to sort of still become something. Mm -hmm. And that made me really hopeful that I could still become something uh, in the long run too. So Um, I just wanted to be something like that for another person and I think that ladder gives me a really good opportunity to be that person for somebody um, to relate to young people and um, you know especially with sort of having the footy platform behind me I think it's pretty powerful that um, we have the ability to make a difference for not just young people but everyone and um, ladder gives me a really good opportunity to sort of fulfill that side of myself. Yeah and Britt you're an amazing human because all of us, I think, in AFLW, like, ladder do come and approach us and speak to us and, and same with the men and, like, it's amazing to listen to but the fact that you were in that room as well and thought, I want to be a part of this and then actually did it, like, full credit to you because I think any kid is lucky to have you as a mentor because, yeah, you just hear about your story and, and watch you play now and, like, I think I'd just be, like, I'd be so happy to be, say that Britt <laughs> Benici is my mentor. So, yeah, you're doing amazing things um, Thanks, in the community. Crazy. So, well done. Um, Collingwood. So, you play... Hot pies. Yeah, you love the pies. <laughs> I you're do all love about, the pies. Yeah, and I love that you love the pies. <laughs> but um, how excited were you when you got drafted? I could not believe it. I'd literally just come 
off not playing for a year. So I thought I was pretty far-fetched putting my hand up yeah. to be drafted at all. Um, and then I got invited to draft night and I was absolutely <laughs> rattled. I had no idea. I didn't even tell my mum and dad until the day before the draft because I was just sort of like – waiting for somebody to be like, nah, I've got you, Britta, like yeah. you're not coming along, Just mate. Disbelief. Yeah. Um, but I'd had a couple of meetings with different clubs and stuff like that and I didn't really know what to expect. AFLW wasn't a thing. So I was just sort of like, yeah, okay, like this I'll just, fun. yeah, <laughs> like I'll just like come along and yeah, draft night came up and Pies called out my name. Dad was absolutely wrapped. Pies fan his entire life. I was about to say, yeah. are they both parents? No, Collingwood? the rest of my family are Essendon, so it was yeah. pretty tough. Go kill dad. To, yeah. Shout out to dad. <laughs> yeah, Woo. love your dad. Um, yeah, the rest of the family were pretty shattered. Um, my pa is like a one-eyed Essendon supporter, so he still finds it a little bit hard, but the rest of the family are slowly coming across. So, um, yeah. Well, it sounds like Nan's a big fan. Yeah, Nan is a big fan. She's just big fan anything for it. She's yeah. my number one supporter, so I'm pretty lucky to have her. Yeah. Um, just on Nan, we need to get her one of these shirts, eh? The my fact that, Nan uh, would absolutely Brute love these. Brute has her own T-shirts. Um, it's For the people that aren't watching the video and just watching listening to the podcast, it's Brit Be- Beer Nietzsche. I love it. It's not a bad little plot, it's is so it? It's so good. They, um, I'm, pr- I'm proud to wear it. Yeah, the Carlton Draft make those ones, yeah. so if you want to go down and purchase one, I'd be pretty wrapped to see a few of those floating around on game day that's oh, for mate. sure i think yeah if louis could fit in this i'd put him in it <laughs> we can make him a fit. one-year-old walking around with a beer shirt uh, probably not a good idea by me <laughs> me and beer that doesn't usually go well together does yeah, it brazy well, i was gonna say i did ask a few of the girls um give me some stories on brit and they're like brazy they're r-rated you can't give them to you and i was like oh. that is a stitch up and a half <laughs> must have been a different brit i don't know oh, who they're please. talking about they're either like brit super serious or she's super fun and there's i couldn't they couldn't give me any story and i was like that's terrible like but no nah, so yeah. back to Collingwood. back to pies i do love the pie i, I do wanted, love the pies. i wanted to drop that i've got a brit Benici <laughs> t-shirt because i absolutely love it yeah well um and we need to get that one <laughs> yeah we will but, get yeah so Tell me about draft night because um, I've said it with all, all the girls. It blows my mind and that we still don't get a choice where you go. Like that's just the footy world. Um, one, were you were you excited to go to Collingwood and were you there in the room thinking, oh, my God, please say my name? Yeah, I think I didn't really care where I went at that yeah. stage. I definitely sort of had a bit of a feel of what different clubs thought of me based off um, – a lot of the interviews I had but I think for me my biggest doubt was a lot of the clubs worry, were worried about my concussions. I'd mm. just come off a year of not playing footy and a lot of the clubs sort of had the question what if like you sort of get hit again. Mm. Um, so going into the draft I was sort of a bit worried that that might scare a couple of teams off but um, I was pretty confident in myself that I, you know I was ready. I wouldn't mm. have put my hand up if I wasn't ready. Um, and Collingwood was sort of the only club who put it on me that if I trust myself, they trust me, um, which is interesting now knowing that I sort of ended up here. Um, but draft night itself was probably the most daunting thing I've mm-hmm. ever done. Um, I think there was 25 girls who had sort of been invited from across Australia. Um, it was 25 or 50 or something like that. But when you walk in and I was this little 18 year old and looking around the room, there were girls who I'd played against for so long. Um, And I was just absolutely rattled that I was even invited alongside so many of these Mm. girls who like I'd played against in the, um, I think it was just called Premier League back there. Mm. Um, I'd played against them and I just absolutely idolized them. And I was sort of sitting in a room with them. I just thought to myself, there's no chance I'm going here with any of these girls. Um, and I remember Alicia Eva was sitting in front of me and um, Steph Ciocci was sitting behind me and it just happened that all three of us got drafted to Pies together. Um, How cool is that? And you were all together. Yeah, and it was a really special moment. Eva had been a coach of mine for a long time. She's somebody I really respect um, and idolise as a player and person and um, she got called out before me and I remember seeing her sort of all excited and I was just like, wow, like... I could never be like that. And then not long later, my name sort of got pulled out too and she looked back at me and she just said, like, let's do this. And um, I can I can just remember it clear as day. It was yeah. so daunting and I couldn't believe that I was even in that situation. And when my name got called out, I couldn't, I'd be lying if I said I didn't shed a tear. I definitely yeah. didn't think that 
I'd ever play AFL footy under this um, brand, under this banner. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it was a pretty special moment. Nah, it's so cool, Britt. And I, lo- I love hearing that, that you just, yeah, waiting. Like, I would just be so nervous. I can't even imagine, like, especially, like, the first draft. Yeah. and like, There would have been so many girls there just hoping that their name got caught out. Absolutely. And there was just so many girls who had put their hand up. Like, there was yeah. – there were – not that many spots in comparison to how many girls wanted to go to be part of the first ever AFLW mm. competition. Um, and there were a lot of girls in the room who I'd played with before um, and just, like I said before, absolutely idolised. There were girls who I would look at at training and just think, like, how are you possibly like that? Mm. And for me, it's really exciting that I got to be exposed to that before the AFLW competition was even a thing because mm. we speak about now how we have this platform and we're the sort of role models and, um, you know, young girls are looking to us and watching us play footy and stuff and it's really exciting that I got to see that at such a raw level. I got to see so many of these women that I look up to work so hard before this was even a thing and I think I try and take that into my game now and my training is mm. they were working so hard before this was ev- even a thing. Like I want to take what that passion that they had beforehand mm. and keep it going yeah. no matter where this competition takes me. Yeah, and also like they might only have a few years in it where you're getting picked up as an 18-year-old. You've got forever to go, you yeah. know. Like I think a lot of the girls get being picked up in their like 28, 30, you don't know how much – like you know it's coming to an end where, yeah, you're getting picked up thinking – I've easily got 10 years plus in this game. Like that's a cool yeah. thing. Like, you, And that's the thing. I think because women's footy is so new as well, you don't know where the competition's going. So it's yeah. really hard to even consider where you're going and yeah. where you're going as sort of an athlete. Um, and to me, that's really exciting. It makes you appreciate this moment more. You can't think about the future you can't think about sort of a couple years time you can't think about how long you're going to be part of the competition all you can genuinely think about is how the competition is shaped right now and where you sit in that yeah um and to me that's really exciting and it's exciting for the young girls who are coming in as well Mm. because they have that pathway um that I once had but they have that pathway now with the exposure to AFLW yeah when I was sort of going through that pathway there was no exposure it was just a pathway yeah. um, that you didn't even know where it was going to take you. Now you know it can take you to the AFLW, but now I've made it here, there's still so much growth for women's footy and it excites me that that means there's so much growth for myself as an athlete and mm. myself as a player that's n- not even known yet. Yeah, you know? it's just the beginning. In, yeah, in yeah. five years' time this competition is going to blow up and you, know, you either go along with it or you get left behind and yeah. you know, you've got to work now to go along with it you, there's no shortcuts there's no hiding away and that really excites me yeah and every year it's getting tougher so you're, you're right there are no shortcuts because you get found out now first couple of years maybe not now it's yeah you yeah. you need to be a good player to be out on the field absolutely and the young girls that are coming through as well like oh, they're elite they are <laughs> so good they're constantly pushing yeah. like for positions like in five years time I'm going to have girls who have been through a pathway with elite coaches elite yeah. Um, facilities, all of this stuff. Like, mm. I gotta get a, a goal. Re- yeah, like, I gotta get a real wiggle on. For fun, before now they've got a goal to make this league, which pushes you and drives you even more. Absolutely. Um, I know we're running out of time, but um, you're one of the. I, I, I'm trying. Like, I'm just sitting here going through my mind. Like, what other player in our team has not missed a footy game? I don't think there's any. No. Nah. So you're the only player in Lucky our team one. from year one who's played every single game, and that's from. I guess new players coming in, players leaving, injuries. You you talk about injuries that you had previously. You've done pretty well to continue like and play every single game today. And I'm touching wood here because I don't <laughs> want that to change. Yes, please. Um, but how how does that one? How does it feel to I guess play all those games? But well, I know we talked about it. It's getting better. But what's the, let's talk about our team rather than the league. How have you felt it change from year one to now? Yeah, it's one of those things you really don't think about it. Mm. Like um, I'm, I think it's come up a little bit more in the past week maybe because I just played my 30th game and um, it's weird it gets celebrated like it's <laughs> something massive. But, it is massive. Um, no one, like we haven't done it. It's yeah, great. Um, 
Wait you're till really, you play 100. Oh, Woo. I know, yeah. <laughs> I'll have to be 50 to make it to 100, but that's all right. Never. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things you sort of don't really think about. I've just been really lucky and um, I think I try to – emulate my game off the field as much as I do on the field. I work really hard on the field, but um, I'm starting to understand that off the field, it's just as important to work hard and look after your body and all of that stuff. And that comes with the pathway that there is now. Um, in terms of our team over the five past five years, it was actually not long ago, me and Steph were looking through the team that we had in year one. And it almost seems like so long ago because mm -hmm. everything is so different now. Um, you know, we have a completely different group of girls, but we've also been able to get girls across. And I think this is probably the biggest part from other sports mm -hmm. like yourself, like Shani, Georgie Parker, when we had her here, girls who have played professional sport at a different level, uh, sorry, professional sport at a different sport, mm -hmm. um, for them to come across and for you guys to be able to show us what it genuinely means to be professional um, is probably the biggest thing because we do start to look after ourselves off the field. We start to understand that footy is not just a game that's played when you cross the white line. Um, and when you start to develop that in a club, you start to develop a whole new culture of care because you can start having hard conversations. You can start pushing each other to be better in different aspects. It's no longer just about who's going to hit the most kicks or kick the most goals or win the most clearances it's genuinely about learning how to develop yourself off the field um, and I think you know with Steve coming through that's been really big and you look at my game how much it's changed in the past two years because I've changed my role it's because of those conversations and that culture mm -hmm. where you can genuinely start to pull people up you can genuinely start to expect more of people as athletes um, and then that all comes back to sort of you know learning how to expose ourselves as people and become better people and better athletes because unless you get the right mix of the two mm. it's very easy to become very consumed in yourself it's very easy to become consumed in wanting to be you know an all Australian Norm Smith medalist all of these things and I think when the AFLW competition first started that was everybody's ideal th for themselves they wanted mm. to be a Dustin Martin a Scott Pendlebury they wanted to be all of these people who everybody knows mm. and now that the competition is started to settle down a little bit we're seeing girls genuinely just want to get the best out of themselves and the best out of each other and I think that's the best thing about the pies this year is we don't care about any of the external stuff it's been a massive week for the club and we don't care about any of that because in our own little sanction we are so tight and we are so ready to do things for each other and that's a massive step forward um in the aflw community yeah well Britt, you're you've been unbelievable to chat to i love talking about you i love talking to you i love watching you i think you're an absolute superstar you talk about the growth of our team and you've been a huge part of it i know you complimented um me and shani and georgie but like you've been a massive part of it and the way you go about your game the way you go about training it's second to none um so thank you and thank you for being um, on the show this week. You're Thanks an absolute for having me, Brazzy. No, Pleasure's mine. Anytime, I might do a second episode with Brit. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs>